The best episode of Star Trek The Next Generation is one in which nothing happens. There's no tense standoff, there's no life-threatening battle of ideologies, there's no political assassination or attempted coup. There isn't even a poker game iconic of the crew's growing friendship. Data doesn't even dance. No, this is sci-fi at its most subtle, and oof, it's real good. At its foundation, science fiction is a genre of speculative writing. It dares to refract the present through the lens of the foreign, offering an unfamiliar perspective that may challenge one's beliefs or morals. It rewrites history in a way that takes the strange and makes it intimate, or the ordinary and makes it alien. It asks questions of what's to come, wondering what our world would look like with something incredible or without something mundane. Asking any one of these questions individually can lead to excellent and provocative storytelling, and has been the foundation of exciting, blood-pumping narratives that take us to fantastical galaxies far, far away, or to bleak futures where we run along the razor's edge of losing our humanity. But those questions can also result in storytelling that takes everything a little bit slower, that has the consideration to stop and think and discuss. Enter Star Trek. Uh, not the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, which is also good, but a different type of good. An adrenaline-filled, Beastie Boys-driven, intelligent man's Fast and Furious sort of good. No, the solutions to the problems presented in the most iconic storylines of the Star Trek TV series were frequently deliberate in action, not ramming an Enterprise-shaped block through a square-shaped force wall. There is not an episode written in this franchise that more boldly goes into answering these questions than Season 5, Episode 25 of Star Trek The Next Generation, The Inner Light. Oh, it's like that George Harrison song! Oh yeah, like the Beatles song. No! George Harrison wrote that song! Beatles, George Harrison, is there a difference? You got like two hours of shore leave? This episode is a masterpiece of storytelling, and it embodies everything that I love about Star Trek. It's a narrative where, ultimately, nothing happens within its runtime, but it still profoundly changes Jean-Luc Picard as a character more than almost any alien, robot, or bored, multidimensional god the Enterprise ever encounters. That's right, Picard's greatest, most life-altering journey does not extend past the bridge of the Enterprise, because it's all in his head. A world within a world, you could say. Oh, and by the way, that Beatles thing wasn't just something we pulled out of our asses, it was actually a very intentional connection. This episode was written by Morgan Gindel, who tried to name all of his episodes after Beatles songs. And this one borrows the name of The Inner Light. Gindel explained in Captain's Logs, the unauthorized complete Trek voyages. The Inner Light was the B-side of Lady Madonna. I thought it would be fun to give every Star Trek episode I wrote a title that's from a different, obscure Beatles song. It was a little joke between me and me. So, with all that out of the way, let's break down the episode real quick. Engage. During some routine scanning, the crew of the Enterprise discover a probe of unknown origin. However, on their approach, the probe flashes and strikes Captain Picard with a ray beam filled with some patented Star Trek techno babble. Picard immediately falls ill, passing out on the floor while daydreaming about Riker. Captain, I've got you. As you do. When Picard awakens, he is in a body that is not his own, on a world that he does not know. Here he is a man named Cayman on a planet called Catan. And that's it. Despite years of disbelief and doubt, Picard lives out the life of this man whose body he now inhabits. He joins a community he does not know, but slowly grows to deeply cherish. He pursues new interests, takes on new hobbies, learns to play the flute. He makes friends, including this dude, who you probably know as Principal Edward Rooney from the Ferris Bueller TV show. Yeah, we'll just unpack that later. Most importantly though, Picard falls in love, he starts a family, and then he grows old and, yeah, then he dies. But as the sun sets on Cayman's life, Picard awakens on the bridge of the Enterprise, himself once more. He's told that only 25 minutes have passed since they discovered the probe and Picard was rendered unconscious, but Picard has been irrevocably changed because this was not a dream or a vision, it was a memory, he was real. As Picard lives out Cayman's life, we learn what happened to Catan and its people. When we first see Catan, we find a world suffering through a drought that only worsens. The soil grows poisoned and inert, and it becomes increasingly clear that the world does not have much time remaining. As the crew of the Enterprise looks after the unconscious Picard, we learn that it was not Catan that was dying, 
but the star that had orbited it. It went supernova a thousand years ago, and the probe encountered by the Enterprise was sent into space to preserve the memory of Catan. The inner light tells a somber tale during its runtime, but the stories it tells off-screen are just as important as those shown directly. We do not see Bataille, Cayman's best friend, die. Instead, he just stops appearing, and Cayman's son is named in his memory. We are not told that Catan scientists discovered that their son was dying rather than the planet. Instead, the people of Catan just start wearing longer clothes. They become concerned about going outside, and the lighting is significantly brightened. We do not hear Picard recount Cayman's life to the crew of the Enterprise. Instead, we see a knowing look and a respectful nod as Riker brings him Cayman's flute and silently departs, leaving Picard alone with his thoughts and with Cayman's memories, which are now his memories too. In fact, even that Cayman is the person through which Picard experiences life on Catan speaks volumes. You see, a recurring character throughout this story is the administrator of the province where Picard lives his life as Cayman. Cayman and this unnamed administrator lightly butt heads a few times. He politely rejects Cayman's suggestions to help reclaim water during the beginnings of the drought when they first meet, and later forcefully orders Cayman to cease his discussions on Catan's doom, fearing that it could cause panic. The administrator then confides in Cayman that other scientists on Catan had reached the same conclusion regarding the collapsing stability of their sun, and that an effort was being made to preserve some slice of life on Catan. This, of course, ends up being the probe that passed along the echoes of Cayman's life to Picard, but just stop for a moment and think about what that means. It's never explicitly told how much of Cayman's life Picard directly influences and how much he simply experienced. Picard obviously has some agency here, but it's also clear that the people he's interacting with as Cayman were also real, and that they had previously existing relationships with Cayman. So, consider what it means then that the administrator chose Cayman as the vessel through which to immortalize Catan. Lesser science fiction would have painted this administrator as a one-dimensional villain who outright rejects the idea that Catan is dying at all. But the inner light composes him as a true leader. Though they did not get along in the few scenes that they shared, the administrator knew that Cayman was right, that he was just trying to do what was best for his family, for his people, and for Catan. The silent action of selecting Cayman as the phantasmal emissary of Catan and its culture speaks volumes and commands enormous respect. All of this together weaves a haunting narrative, one that profoundly impacts Jean-Luc Picard as a person, and not just in the faintness of moving his hand towards a non-existent door switch or the newfound ability to play the flute. Let's take a moment to consider who Picard is. He is one of the most respected leaders in the Galactic Federation, the captain of Starfleet's flagship, and he chose that path pointedly. He married his career, he committed himself to the Federation. He dedicated himself to his ship and his crew and the ideas of peace, exploration, and knowledge. In an instant, all of that changed. Through Cayman, he knew what it meant to give himself to another, to build a life with someone as a partner. We get to see that relationship grow, blossom, and bloom. Enough so that I get choked up by a phrase as simple as... Put your shoes on. More tragically, during the episode, Picard explains that he never wanted or expected to have any children, but he gives up on his past life, on his dream of traveling the stars once more when he admits to Cayman's wife that he wants a nursery. And after children become a part of his life, he could not bear the thought of living without them. So how painful must it have been to go through Cayman's life knowing that his children would not get to live as long or as fully as he has, for reasons completely out of their control? That pain leads Picard to teach them to live now, to pursue their loves and their passions now. Because now will never come again. Like Zen Buddhism. Exactly. The themes of this episode lean heavily on the philosophies of Zen Buddhism. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that I understand the ideologies of Buddhism thoroughly, but I do understand mindfulness. This is a meditative practice often used in Buddhist psychological traditions, and it teaches you to breathe, to drop, anchor, and look at the current moment, because that is what matters most in the present. And to tie it all back in, because I said it was important, these are all ideas George Harrison brought westward with his music. The Harrison song from which this episode borrows its name starts with the line, Without going out of my door, I can know all things of Earth. Without leaving the bridge, Picard knows all things of Catan. 
Not only does he experience the culture, lives, and dilemmas of the people of Catan, he also experiences a life he never planned for himself, that of a family man with children and grandchildren. And imagine, then, to have that all ripped away from him as he returns to the body of Jean-Luc Picard and a life now alien to him. The only symbol left of Cayman, of his life on Catan, of his wife that he loved dearly, of his children that he could not conceive of losing but now must live without, is the flute that he clutches so tenderly to his chest, and the song he plays to an audience long dead. Two seasons earlier, Picard had his humanity robbed from him, but it was given back to him here. Patrick Stewart deserved a goddamn Emmy for this performance. What makes The Inner Light such a poignant story is its commentary on love, memory, and how those things bind us together. The people of Catan believed that even in the face of their inevitable tragedy, if they were somehow able to touch just one life, one far-flung voyager in an unwritten future, then even at the end of all things, it would not be the end. Going back to my Beatles discography, Harrison also touched on this idea in his song Within You Without You from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Harrison wrote, When you've seen beyond yourself, then you may find peace of mind is waiting there. And the time will come when you see we're all one, and life flows on within you and without you. This is a beautiful message, and why I am on the verge of tears every time I watch an aged Picard, surrounded by the ghosts of a life that wasn't his that he lived anyway. What the inner light says about what it means to love, and what it means to live, cannot be overstated. It says that emotion is what transcends time and place, that what you feel now is just as real as what you felt then. That the affection you feel for the people standing beside you right now is as real as the love you feel for those a billion miles away. As legitimate as what you felt years ago. That the memory of the dead can be just as warm as the touch of the living right in front of us. What is the difference between a smile given by the sight of someone you love and the smile taken by the thought of another? Is there even a difference? All of it comes from the same place. The one referenced by the title of this episode, The Inner Light. Other science fiction has explored this idea to varying degrees of success, ranging from heartbreaking sentimentality to well-meaning heavy-handedness. But it is with the bittersweet subtlety that The Inner Light reminds us to live, live now, make now always the most precious time. Now will never come again. But it can live forever. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please remember to like and subscribe to Normal Boots for more Worlds Within Worlds in the future. And if you want even more right now, go check out our video about how Frank Herbert's dusty, crusty old book Dune is the reason games like League of Legends and World of Warcraft exist. It's gonna blow your mind.